Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Stephen Flanagan. I'm Senior Vice President and Henry A. Kissinger Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon on the eve of President Obama's first trip to Europe and indeed uh, a trip that will see a, a two-day stop in Turkey. So we're quite excited to, to, be, uh, to be able to chat with you today about this uh, work that's been underway here for the last year at the Center with a number of my colleagues arrayed before you here today. And, uh, Distinguished Senior Advisory Group to try to uh, to look at, in a systematic way uh, at Turkey's changing internal dynamics, its political and social dynamics, and how those are evolving and how it's affecting Turkey's worldview and Turkey's relations with all of its neighbors. Uh, we've drawn together experts uh, with uh, backgrounds on Turkey, on Europe, on Russia, Eurasia, on the Middle East, and, and on energy issues, uh, and to try to, to, to come to uh, some kind of an assessment of where U.S.-Turkish relations are headed. We wanted to look at not, not just Turkey from the perspective of Washington, but to look at it from various vantage points around the region uh, and various points even within Turkey itself. And our goal was to try to identify uh, the key challenges to U.S.-Turkish relations in the coming years and also to propose a, a new strategic framework that uh, could uh, both ensure the renewal of this vital uh, alliance relationship but also to uh, ensure its management uh, over, the next, uh, over the next decade. And before I begin, I do want to take a moment, though, to recognize a number of uh, guests in the audience. Uh, first of all, Ambassador uh, Nabi Senshoy, of the, uh, of the uh, Ambassador to Washington of the Turkish Republic. Uh, we want to thank him and all of his colleagues here in Washington, but also those in the Foreign Ministry and other parts of the, of the government for their openness and willingness to engage in a dialogue with us as we pursue this work. Um, and secondly, I also want to recognize Ambassador Ross Wilson, who served uh, very ably as Ambassador of the United States of America to uh, Turkey uh, from, 19, uh, from 2005 to 2008, and who was uh, very helpful to us, along with a number of his colleagues in the embassy and also on the Turkish desk in the State Department and other parts of the government, uh, to ensure also that we had a full understanding of what the state of U.S. policy was and how uh, efforts had been underway even uh, in the last several years to put the U.S.-Turkish relationship back on a steady footing, and Ambassador Wilson and his colleagues deserve uh, a great deal of credit for that as well in the previous administration. Um, but uh, as we undertook this work over the last, uh, the last year, we, we really benefited tremendously from uh, the, uh, the advice and counsel of a, of a sage group of, of senior advisors, uh, co-chaired by uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski and uh, General Brent Scowcroft. Uh, including a number of other distinguished uh, former officials and, and military leaders. And we are really grateful for the uh, significant commitment of time and intellect that they gave to this effort, uh, for their strategic vision, which is really what we were mostly after, their wisdom, uh, but also their patience uh, in the conduct of our work, which was sometimes a bit slow in coming. But we really wanted to get this right. And I, I hope, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, my voice went a little skittish today. Uh, we hope that it, it reflects some of those insights, but I just want to be, be clear that these, uh, these distinguished gentlemen did not uh, exercise editorial control. We alone are responsible for the, for the content. So, uh, so any complaints directed at us, please, not, not at, uh, at these two uh, uh, fine co-chairs and other members of the group. So um, I'm going to uh, welcome to the podium to make some brief opening remarks, uh, uh, Drs. Brzezinski and Scowcroft. But before I do, I also want to recognize uh, um, uh, two other members of the group who are, of the advisory group who are in the audience. First of all, Ambassador James H. Holmes, uh, who uh, is uh, now a president, of course, and CEO of the American Turkish Council and also served as deputy chief of mission in Ankara and ambassador to Latvia, as well as a number of other positions in the State Department. And uh, Ambassador James, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> General James Jamerson, uh, a former uh, deputy commander of the uh, U.S. European Command, uh, who is now uh, with Lockheed Martin, but uh, who was also another uh, great uh, counsel to us, and, and we, we appreciate his views. Three members of the group could not make it today, and I do want to just also thank them uh, in absentia. First of all, Ambassador Morton Abramowitz, former ambassador to Turkey also, senior fellow now at the Century Foundation, uh, and uh, uh, the Honorable uh, John McLaughlin, uh, former deputy director of national intelligence and uh, now a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, all of them really provided us with uh, invaluable assistance. So let me turn uh, now, uh, first of all, to Dr. Brzezinski, who I, I might add, and it's no longer a state secret, who uh, just celebrated his, uh, since we celebrated his 80th birthday here uh, this time last year, celebrated his 80th, 81st birthday on Saturday, Dr. Brzezinski. 
Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much for mentioning my birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much for mentioning that it's one plus eight. For that reason, I jumped up those stairs, Obama-like. I'm going to be very brief. Um, this report is important in its own right, but it's made doubly important by the fact that the President of the United States is about to visit Turkey. So I've just jotted down for myself ten reasons why, in my view, Turkey is really important to us. It is important in general. One, it is true and tried ally of the United States. Secondly, it is a geostrategically key member of NATO. Three, it is an EU candidate. Four, it is a Muslim democracy. Five, it is a stabilizing factor in the region. Six, it is a constructive partner with Israel. Seven, it is a positive influence on Iran. Eight, it is an example for the Turkic-speaking countries of the former Soviet Union. Nine, it is an intermediary between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And ten, it is a vital link in Europe's efforts to diversify its dependence on energy. So in all these ways, it really is an important country, and therefore the strategic relationship, which our colleagues discuss with it, is of enormous importance both to us and it should be our hope to the Turks as well. Thank you, Thank you uh, General Skilcroft. I won't mention his age. I've, I've learned. I, I am capable of learning. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It's a joy to be associated with such a young colleague. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and as usual, you know, we're sort of the Bobsy twins now around town. Uh, uh, he said everything that needs to be said. Uh, let, me just, let me just point out that these ten reasons for importance have always been around, but our relationship with Turkey has gone through several different evolutions. For the first sort of 50 years, we were good NATO allies. They were one of our strongest NATO allies, and the relationship was almost entirely military. By well, the end of the Cold War, that began to change, but there wasn't anything that picked up really on the military uh, right away. Then came Iraq and the difficulty we had with U.S. troops going through Turkey and so on, and that started a sort of a downturn. And at the same time, the world was becoming more complicated, and the domestic situation inside Turkey was becoming more complicated. So all of these mean that what's big put up is why we need to worry about it. What you're going to hear this afternoon is how complicated much of it is now to sort our way through the problems that have arisen and maintain the importance of Turkey to us. They did a great job. Uh, we bear no responsibility nor credit for what they've done. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Thank you, General Scowcroft. Um, now, I'd like to, before introducing my colleagues uh, who will discuss uh, some of the elements of their, of their work, I just want to set a little bit of the context. <clears throat> Excuse me. We... Um, we began this project, as I mentioned, uh, about a year ago, and we were very conscious that there's a rich uh, array of literature and, and many studies out there on U.S.-Turkey relations. And we wanted to, to draw on that first before we proceeded. And what we felt that was our sort of somewhat value added to this process and a unique element of what we were trying to do was also to look at, at Turkey uh, from these other perspectives, from how are other countries also looking at Turkey and how did Turkey play uh, in the various discussions within particularly the energy community about about its role as an energy hub. So we, we brought together this kind of perspective uh, as well as drawing on some of the very good work and some of the uh, individuals represented even in this room today who, who have thought uh, long and hard about Turkey. But we, uh, we felt that this was a, a unique contribution we could bring by bringing together the perspectives of some of our colleagues who aren't Turkish experts and indeed <clears throat> our senior advisory group well, many of them know Turkey quite well. We also wanted others who would provide some additional strategic perspective on Turkey's importance and Turkey's changing 
uh, role in the world. We, uh, we moved to, uh, then to a fairly extensive field research. We held uh, a dozen round over two dozen roundtables here in Washington and elsewhere around the world. Uh, interviews with over 130 uh, journalists, government officials, military officers, scholars, and business and civic leaders uh, in the United States, Turkey, uh, the Middle East, and Europe. And so we have tried to bring all of this experience to bear. We also were very fortunate to, uh, to engage uh, uh, with the, in a cooperative uh, venture, uh, although somewhat in parallel, with the Ankara-based uh, research organization, TEPAV, which is uh, linked to the Turkish uh, Chambers of Commerce, TOB. Uh, and, and has been an ongoing partner of CSIS in, in a very variety of other uh, studies, particularly under Bulent Ali Reza's uh, Turkey project here for, for over 15 years. Uh, and they have undertaken a parallel review, which uh, on the Turkish side, looking at the U.S.-Turkish relationship, and that will be uh, presented in Ankara uh, next month. And so we're very pleased to be uh, to have had that partnership and the benefits of those insights. Now, <clears throat> just a word about context. We proceeded from the assumption that, uh, and, and was, I think it was borne out in the context of our research, that the United States and Turkish uh, have a convergent strategic interest uh, by and large, that uh, both countries have enduring interest in stability in the Middle East, in countering terrorism and extremism, in sustaining the, uh, an open global economy, in securing energy flows, uh, advancing the stability and sovereignty of states in the Caucasus and Central Asia, and in maintaining productive relations with Europe. Uh, that said, uh, mistrust and suspicion in recent years, uh, much of it related to the war in Iraq and its aftermath, uh, have clouded this uh, sense of convergence and, and sometimes complicated cooperation. There have also been fundamental changes in Turkey's domestic situation and neighborhood that have altered how Turks perceive uh, and pursue their interests. And U.S. Uh, global and regional priorities have also shifted, of course, uh, since 2001. So these differing uh, political and geostrategic situations will on occasion, we think, lead uh, the two countries to pursue distinct and even sometimes divergent policies, and relations may be somewhat unpredictable. Uh, but keeping the relationship on course, uh, we think, will, will require a, a, a careful management and a high-level attention by both governments. And it looks as if, uh, certainly by all signs of it, <clears throat> some of the first steps the Obama administration has taken uh, several phone calls, uh, phone calls already to the, to the President and Prime Minister in, in Turkey, um, Secretary Clinton's visit, uh, 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 Ambassador Mitchell's uh, visit, and now, of course, the visit of the President all suggest that this, this is moving towards some kind of, this kind of level of engagement, which we think is going to be essential to keep, uh, to keep this relationship on course. So with that context set, let me turn now to uh, several of my project uh, coll uh, colleagues in this, in this effort. Uh, first of all, beginning with Bulent Ali Riza, who I mentioned has been uh, director and senior of the and senior associate of the Turkey Project here uh, for for over 15 years, and he will focus on Turkey's internal dynamics. We'll then turn to Haim Malka, who's deputy director of the uh, and fellow at the uh, CSIS Middle East program, to discuss Turkey's relations with the Middle East uh, and U.S. Uh, Turkish coordination on policy in the Middle East. Then uh, to Edward Chow, who, who is uh, a senior associate in the uh, Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, to talk about Turkey's projects, uh, prospects excuse me, as an energy bridge and U.S.-Turkish uh, policy coordination in that area. And then lastly, uh, I will come back to some of our other specific recommendations about U.S.-Turkish relations and, and also the Turkey-Russia, Turkey-EU uh, relationship. Uh, that, uh, in the absence of, of two of our colleagues who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today, Andrew Cutchins, who is a senior fellow and director of the CSIS Russia Eurasia program, and Julianne Smith, who is senior fellow and director of the CSIS Europe program until, uh, until just last week when she moved over to the Department of Defense. Um, uh, lastly, I do want to also recognize, uh, first of all, my indispensable uh, wingman in this effort, uh, Samuel Brannan, who is senior fellow uh, in the International Security Program, who uh, served as deputy director of this initiative. Uh, and also uh, two contributing uh, authors, uh, uh, Ian Lesser, who is uh, a senior uh, transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund, who contributed a very insightful piece on Cyprus, and Alexandros Peterson uh, from the Atlantic Council of the United States, who uh, also uh, worked with Andrew Cutchins on, uh, on the Russia-Eurasia analysis. So let me now turn to Bulent Aliriza. Thanks. i will also like to underline uh, Sam's importance to this whole project, because uh, uh, Sam began uh, his CSIS career at the Turkey Project, and then after a stint at the DOD, came back in, uh, to work with Steve 
And frankly, that insight that he had into both uh, uh, Turkey and the, uh, the way in which the, the U.S. government functions was indispensable to the project. Good luck at the DOD, Sam. Okay. Uh, I guess I had the most interesting and, and the most difficult uh, uh, chapter to write because, um, you know, look at the title, Turkey's Changing Dynamics. By its nature, the, uh, these change constantly, and it's difficult to describe, let alone to, to predict, to look uh, into the future. But, you know, I uh, tried to, to do justice to, uh, to the task that was given to me, and, uh, and frankly, I think the, the report uh, was vindicated by the, the local election results in, uh, in which uh, we were able to predict some of the, uh, some of the trends that have actually uh, uh, influenced the, the election results. I've only got a few minutes, so uh, let me uh, uh, touch on the, uh, the, the five, uh, uh, six different sections, hopefully with a view to uh, whetting your appetite so you read the, the whole report. Uh, we begin with uh, AK and the, and the secular system. Um, the, the ruling party um, in the local elections has suffered a uh, reverse for the first time since it came into, into power. Um, um, since in November 2002. Until then, it was an upward trajectory. Uh, it remains to be seen how it will react to its first reverse. It still has more, uh, a higher percentage than the next two parties, the two opposition parties combined. Uh, it was able to retain the, uh, uh, the, the mayoral races in Ankara and Istanbul. So it's not going to be replaced uh, anytime soon. Nonetheless, uh, there is now, for the first time, a question mark over the, uh, the AK um, domination of Turkish uh, politics. And those questions were, were raised in, uh, in, in the paper. Um, AK has its origins in the, in the uh, Islamist movement, but from the very outset, this party said that it was not Islamist, unlike um, uh, the, uh, the Islamist, its Islamist predecessors that were closed down. Uh, it tried to work within the Turkish secular system, the constitutional framework in which it governed uh, remained secular, and that led to tensions, uh, most notably in 2007, when the Constitution Court almost closed the, uh, 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 the, the ruling party uh, down uh, to, to ban it, which would have been unprecedented. Those tensions have not gone away because, frankly, what we're still waiting for is a compromise that will allow for um, greater religiosity in Turkish society uh, to live comfortably within a constitutional framework that still remains secular. What about the growing religiosity that, uh, that I go into in the, in the chapter? Undoubtedly, Turkey uh, is visibly uh, more religious than it was. It still remains uh, secular. Um, so there are tensions that are inherent in this, most notably with respect to the, to the headscarf ban. Here is a government. Um, uh, composed of people whose mothers, wives, and daughters cover, unable to convert its, uh, its majority into a uh, legislative decision to reverse what uh, um, uh, the women folk regard, uh, as well as many of their supporters regard, as unacceptable, uh, unacceptably onerous um, uh, restrictions. So those, that, that manifests the kind of uh, tensions in, in uh, society. Uh, irrespective of when uh, uh, the AKP, um, uh, what happens to it and what its political future is, Turkey will remain a religious country, and whoever replaces the AKP eventually, and, and somebody will at some stage, will have to come to terms with the fact that this is a country which is secular, but its people are religious. What about the Turkish military? Clearly, you know, you cannot discuss uh, Turkish politics without discussing the role of the Turkish military. Uh, that's another cause of the, of the tensions uh, inherent in, in Turkish society. After all, there have been four military interventions of one kind or another in the past 50 years. Uh, the Turkish military still remains largely autonomous. It still exercises influence uh, far beyond the purely national security area. Uh, there seems to have, uh, uh, be an easing of tensions which uh, uh, after the 2003-2004 period when, as we now read, uh, there were apparently uh, a discussion within the high ranks of the TGS as to replacing the elected government uh, 
in, uh, through extra-parliamentary means of one form or another. And then 2007, when the TGS, the Turkish General Staff, opposed publicly the election of Abdullah Gül to the presidency. Uh, those tensions seem to have abated somewhat. Nonetheless, uh, the, the Turkish uh, uh, um, civilian military relationship does not conform to the, to the Western, accepted Western model. Turkey is unique in, in, in that sense. If Turkey were to join the EU, clearly that would have to be changed. That's not the case, and the Turkish military remains a very important component of the overall equation. The Kurdish conundrum, as we called it in the, in the piece. Look at the results yesterday. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the DTP, which is facing closure for uh, separatism, like uh, its predecessors, managed to win overwhelming victories in the Iraq and, uh, and other provinces in the southeast, uh, which is ethnically Kurdish. Uh, the, uh, although Turkey has been grappling with and successfully defeating PKK terrorism, uh, and therefore the threat of Kurdish separatism, or literally tearing the southeastern provinces away from Turkey and setting up an independent republic. Nonetheless, the, the causes of the uh, disaffection that leads uh, to volunteers joining the PKK or uh, people supporting the, the DTP um, confirm that there is a problem with uh, a, a group that has not been assimilated, that does not feel satisfied, with the steps that have been, been taken uh, to deal with its grievances. I think Turkey uh, will not break up because of the, the Kurdish issue, but nonetheless, the Kurdish question uh, that, uh, that, have been, that has been addressed both by the Prime Minister as well as by the current Chief of Staff as one that cannot be solved by purely military means uh, will be a feature in, in, in Turkish politics. The economic difficulties. Uh, that was one of the more interesting um, excuse me, issues to, um, to deal with, because frankly, it's impossible to understand what's going on in Turkey without referring to, to the economic uh, situation. The current party came into office through its electoral victory in November 2002 that owed a great deal to the economic difficulties, the economic crisis of 2000-2001. Its reverse in the local elections is undoubtedly due to the global economic crisis, which is finally beginning to, to hit Turkey. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the growth projections uh, by the IMF, what they're actually predict projecting for Turkey is, is a negative growth for the first time, uh, whereas the, the budget that, uh, that the government currently adopted is, uh, uh, envisions a, a growth of 4%. I mean, clearly, um, something is awry. And what's awry is that the, the process of globalization uh, that Turkey enthusiastically supported, including during the past six years of the, the current government, its integration into, into the global economy is now making Turkey suffer because of what we may call reverse globalization. Clearly, the kind of funds that were available before to go into emerging markets is not going to be there. And what you're seeing is uh, the stock market, uh, less than half of what it was, um, unemployment rising, and whichever government is in, in office is clearly uh, going to uh, pay the price, and this government is, is, is certainly doing it. Now, Turkey possesses uh, great advantages, location, a young labor force, um, a, a very vibrant uh, business community, and surely will pick up uh, before many other countries. But nonetheless, the current government's attempts to, to minimize the, the economic difficulties, um, its um, delay in, in going for an IMF deal that might have provided some degree of confidence to the international financial community uh, is likely to prove costly. Looking ahead uh, a little bit, excuse me, my mouth went dry today, is clearly the economic situation. If the economic crisis uh, hits Turkey har harder than the current government uh, and its supporters hope, then, you know, frankly, uh, all bets are off. Uh, we'll have to see how much it, uh, it changes the, the, the domestic political situation. The most important external factor is, of course, the uh, future of the EU process. Turkey uh, has finally begun accession negotiations. Um, uh, it's uh, got a number of difficulties in that process. The reform process in Turkey was tied uh, to, to EU accession. And if that were to stop, uh, then frankly, again, as I said, uh, it's going to affect Turkish domestic politics. 
with that, I think I'll stop, and I want we can deal with the, the U.S.-Turkish relationship in the Q&A uh, session. Great. Thank you very much, Bulan. Uh, hi, Malka, for the uh, perspectives on Turkish relations with the Middle East. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in this incredibly uh, enlightening project. I learned a lot from all of my colleagues, from Sam, from you, and from the advisory group as well. Um, I have to take issue with one thing that Bulan said. I think I definitely had the most interesting and the most difficult chapter to write on this uh, in looking at the Middle East. I don't think you can really look at the Middle East today without uh, taking account of Turkey and Turkish diplomacy in the region today. And in many ways, the Middle East will be the test case for U.S.-Turkey cooperation uh, for the foreseeable future. I think the Middle East is an arena where many of our most crucial national security issues for both the United States and for Turkey overlap. Turkey is intimately tied to the future of Iraq, uh, and it will shape in some way what Iraq will look like. As a member of the United States uh, of the UN Security Council, Turkey will also play a greater role uh, in the debate over Iran and Iran's pursuit of nuclear technology and nuclear weapons program. And Turkey's activism, renewed activism and commitment in the region, has made it a pivotal player. I think we all agree on that, and the report clearly shows that. Uh, and it can be a, a real potential asset to the United States. The U.S. can benefit greatly from Turkey's soft influence and efforts to stabilize the region, as well as its mediation efforts, which we've seen. But at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge that Turkey's activism and regional diplomacy has the potential to create tension with the United States as well over different policies and different policy outcomes. And how we manage that tension that's going to arise in the next couple of years will have a significant impact on the success of U.S.-Turkish cooperation moving forward across a wide range of issues, even beyond the Middle East. So I think the challenge for the U.S. and Turkey now is really to define the space where Turkey's diplomacy can be mutually beneficial and complementary to the United States rather than competitive. The benefits are clear, uh, and we've seen them over the last few years. Dr. Brzezinski, I think, in number five mentioned that Turkey is a force for stability, uh, and I think that's incredibly important. We've seen Turkey play an active role helping to push forward the status of forces agreement between the U.S. and Iraq. We've seen Turkey using its influence uh, with Sunni tribes in Iraq as a force for stability and is helping the security situation over the last couple of years. Turkey has a wide range of diplomatic contacts and has been useful and important as a regional mediator. We saw that through the facilitation of four rounds of Israeli-Syrian indirect negotiations and a potentially fifth round uh, of negotiations as well. And I think Turkey can, can be a trusted interlocutor for the United States with a range of countries and a range of actors, including Iran. More broadly, Turkey and the U.S. have many similar interests in the region, especially in, uh, in terms of Iraqi stability, in terms of promoting Israeli-Palestinian peace and preventing a nuclear Iran. But again, at the same time, we have to recognize that there are different priorities, different strategies, and possibly different desired outcomes on a range of these issues. Uh, there are certainly different perceptions between the United States and Turkey over the nature of Iran's nuclear program. There are certainly different priorities uh, and per perhaps desired outcomes over the future of the Kurdish region in Iraq and the status of Kirkuk. Another potentially uh, dangerous issue is the Palestinian question, uh, which has caused a lot of tension recently, a lot of public tension. And this is an arena where Turkey seeks to play a more active role. But again, Turkey has a very different perspective on the Palestinian question than the United States does. It has a very different strategy. It has recognized the Hamas government. Uh, it wants to play a more active role in internal Palestinian dialogue and efforts to reconcile Palestinian factions. But this is a very crowded uh, field uh, of mediators. We have the Qataris playing a role. The Egyptians are also playing an active role. And, and so it's important to find the right space for Turkey to play a constructive, uh, a constructive role there. I think neither Turkey nor the United States can afford to hold any of these issues as a litmus test or hold any of these issues hostage uh, to the relationship, be it Iran or the Palestinian issue. And I think in, in thinking through and, and trying to define Turkey's role in regional diplomacy, we have to ask some difficult, difficult questions. Um, 
we have to be pragmatic about what assets Turkey actually brings to the table. It clearly has leverage in Iraq and the Kurdish region. It has economic and political clout there. It can convene parties and facilitate negotiations, as we saw in the Israeli-Syrian example. It can certainly deliver messages, diplomatic messages, as a go-between. But I think we have to acknowledge as well that having access to regional players doesn't necessarily mean uh, that there is influence over those regional actors, and we have to be realistic about that. There's a question mark whether Turkey has uh, the kind of leverage over Iran, Syria, or the Hamas leadership to actually change uh, the behavior of any of those governments or actors. And as the United States uh, is more willing to engage some of these actors, like Iran and Syria, I think it changes uh, the nature of Turkey's own mediation role. So I think it's extremely vital to U.S. and Turkish interests that we can coordinate closely with Turkey in Middle East diplomacy. And I think the, asking these, these tough questions is in no way uh, questioning Turkey's ability or its, or its role, but acknowledging uh, that we do have differences, and I think acknowledging those differences will actually help both Turkey and the U.S. define our rules moving forward more clearly, and it will ultimately strengthen uh, the level of cooperation across a range of mutual interests. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Hein. And now for uh, a review on the energy bridge challenges uh, from Ed and opportunities from Edward Chow. Thank you, Steve. Um, as you have indicated and as our senior advisors have already, already articulated, uh, the United States has a full and complex agenda uh, with Turkey and, and a, a very uh, complicated set of relationships. Uh, and since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, for almost 20 years, energy has often been added uh, to that uh, agenda and has become an important factor. Uh, in many ways, um, uh, that had worked in the 1990s. Um, part of my contention is that it's the 1990s are not easily replayed, uh, that some of the lessons that can be drawn from the convergence of American and U.S. interests uh, in Central Asia, for example, uh, U.S. and Turkish interests, are no longer play out exactly the same way. I mean, for example, today Turkey has a much different relationship with Russia than it did in the 1990s. It has a different set of relationship with, with Iran uh, than, than it uh, did then. Um, and so I, I often wonder whether there is a over-promise uh, sometimes of saying that uh, uh, energy is an asset that can be used uh, in U.S. Um, uh, Turkish building on U.S. Turkish relationship and, and whether a, a lowering of expectations and being more realistic in our assessment on how much can be done and how soon things can be done uh, would be worthwhile. It, it, uh, some of you know that I come from uh, the energy business uh, and tend to think of uh, the industry as a business. And in the energy business, the, 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 what's important is geology, geology, geology. Well, uh, in Turkey's case, if you don't have geology, what's important is location, 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 which uh, Turkey certainly has in, in, uh, uh, in all respects. It's an important transit country. It is already an important transit country. It's a transit country that has half a dozen projects already on its soil. It has pipeline capacity of over 3 million barrels per day. Uh, not to speak of the 2.5, 3 million barrels per day that uh, passes through the Bosphorus every day. Um, it has four major gas pipelines on its soil, uh, transiting uh, as well as importing gas uh, for Turkey. It also has an important liquefied natural gas import facility. Uh, so to say that, that something needs to be done uh, uh, to build Turkey as an energy bridge is to perhaps discount that it is already a very important uh, transit country. But transit projects take a long, long time uh, to put together. Uh, they easily take three to five years if everything goes smoothly. More uh, commonly, it takes five to seven uh, years gestation between be, before a major pipeline is built. Certain other things are important. Sequencing of projects. One 
does not build a pipeline without the upstream capacity to fill the pipeline. Um, so therefore, transit countries generally don't build pipelines before production is available. Who has the pr primary financial stake in the success of a transit project, uh, a pipeline, for example, is also an important factor in the ultimate success of transit projects. Generally speaking, they are the major oil producers, sometimes in gas, often in gas, is also the major gas consumers uh, as well. So if you look at um, Turkey's situation today, in order to build on its already uh, uh, quite substantial transit capacity, the first challenge is to increase upstream capacity, particularly in Central Asia. And here foremost, the first, it w I would say, Azerbaijan. The further gas development in Azerbaijan uh, is an area that Turkey and the United States can be working together. We ought to see Turkey's uh, potential demand for, for that gas as an important asset rather than as a detriment to uh, transiting gas to, to Europe. Um, and even more important but longer term is the underdevelopment of gas in uh, Turkmenistan and the fact that that country is currently still not open to major Western uh, oil, and, uh, oil and gas investments so that there will be companies there with the interest of moving volumes west rather than moving them north to Russia, south to Iran, or east to China. Those are things, uh, th th that is number one uh, in my mind in terms of priority uh, if one wants to strengthen um, uh, Turkey's role as a transit uh, provider. Uh, the other uh, important element is to uh, build on um, the existing infrastructure uh, so that the sunk capital is fully utilized. There's underutilized capacity in the Kirkuk to Jehan pipeline. The uh, Baku to Plisi Jehan pipeline can, uh, can be increased in capacity. Uh, that capital, the, the major uh, capital investments already sunk. Volumes can be increased. As Turkey's reputation uh, and, and uh, it improves uh, and confidence in the international, uh, um, among international industry uh, uh, in Turkey as a uh, reliable transit partner uh, increases, additional infrastructure may be built, but over time. And here, my last pitch is to uh, uh, say uh, uh, a call for quiet diplomacy on the part of uh, uh, the United States, something that perhaps we're not as good at as we should be. Um, things, since these things take a long time, they're not quick fixes. They're not very elegant foreign policy tools by and large. There is the temptation of getting in the ring with Vladimir Putin and with which much louder uh, action uh, on, on winning transit deals. And there I think it's a mistake. Um, it is like you know, um, trying to play uh, hockey uh, in the home rink of the Russian team when we don't have skates and we don't have sticks. Um, the Russians are willing to do suboptimal economic projects. They have the oil and gas, they have the money for now to subsidize pipelines. Western governments, generally speaking, do not subsidize oil and gas transit uh, um, uh, uh, projects. Um, and unless we are willing and able to do that, uh, it is better to work on our strengths, which has to do with making sure that the Central Asian producers in particular continue to have economic autonomy and political independence in their own region, that therefore alternative supply routes are important to them. Turkey is an important factor there. We, the lesson that is often not sufficiently learned from the Baku Tbilisi Jehan experience is that Baku Supsa got built first that the smaller projects demonstrate the viability of a route and more volumes will follow when smaller projects get done first. So you score by not swinging for home runs by trying to string a bunch of singles together. 
that's what the, the risk management of the oil industry um, uh, would generally call for, um, and, and therefore uh, quiet American diplomacy uh, talking to Turkey about areas of interest that are that where we converge but need not be identical, uh, I think is an important um, uh, thought that I want to leave behind for U.S. policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, Ed really uh, played a great role in educating all of us about uh, about the the economics of energy, uh, but um, and, and the geopolitics of it as well. But let me uh, now just briefly touch on a, a bit about uh, Turkey's changing relations with uh, the European Union and with uh, Russia and, and some of its neighbors in Eurasia, and then briefly close with. Uh, some thoughts on, on managing the U.S.-Turkish relationship, and then that should lead a, leave us with uh, a good 30 minutes for uh, your comments and discussion. So please bear with me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We, uh, with regard to Turkey and Europe, and this is uh, drawing on, on Julian Smith's good work on this, we point out that the EU and Turkey are really, uh, really at a critical juncture in the relationship. While well, both sides have reaffirmed their commitment to the accession process, uh, progress has been fitful, of course, and and enlargement fatigue uh, and concerns about Turkey's uh, progress, has, uh, uh, Turkey's uh, political and social direction have uh, deepened an abiding reticence uh, among a number of European leaders and the press and public about, about whether Turkey should and, and could ever be a full member of the Union. And there's growing frustration uh, about the pace of the talks in Turkey and about Europe's willingness to ultimately really offer EU membership. And it's led to, I think, a certain amount of a diminished commitment on the part of, of Turkish officials and the public to undertake the necessary reforms. Now, that said, it is indeed true that, uh, that the Turkish government has recently appointed Egemon Baj, very close advisor to Prime Minister Erdogan, as the senior uh, uh, official dealing with EU. And, and certainly there's, there's still a lot of uh, energy and commitment there. But, but I think we have to look at the, the actual steps in reform and the, and the progress in reform and also sort of the, uh, the sort of lagging uh, interest in the EU, which really reflects not so much even anything that Turkey in per se is doing, but as much as the, a bit of enlargement fatigue and the, and the sort of post-Lisbon fatigue uh, uh, as well uh, sort of kicking in on that, not to mention, obviously, the global economic crisis. So, so it, is a, it is a challenging period. But nonetheless, Turkey is facing a specific deadline this year uh, in late 2009 uh, during the uh, Swedish presidency. Uh, due to some commitments that were made uh, under a, a 2005 protocol uh, to open its ports and airports to the Republic of Cyprus. Uh, and this had to do with the, uh, the accession of Cyprus uh, uh, to the European Union at the time, the Republic of Cyprus, and, and other, other uh, efforts uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, advance, advance and normalization of relations to that process. And, Given that there really hasn't been a signal yet from the Turkish government on the part of a new approach towards uh, Cyprus, and, and I'll touch a little bit briefly on, on the uh, sort of the uncertain prospects for uh, resolution of the, of the Cypriot problem between the two communities on the island, uh, it seems as if this could, be, this could be a bit of a bump on the road. And indeed, some countries or even uh, in Europe, I think, would like to use this as, a, as, a, as a, at least a, an immediate pretext for further suspension uh, of, of the negotiation or blocking off other, other chapters in the uh, accession discussions, uh, and some of which are already blocked due to Cyprus differences, eight of them, in fact. Um, and, and one of the big problems we note is that while the EU member governments are somewhat divided, the Nordics and some of the northern European countries, the British, are more supportive. Uh, other European leaders are much more outspoken and, and, and ranging from tepid to outright, uh, outright opposition. And there really isn't any, any clear champion within the European Union for the Turkish, uh, the Turkish cause. This notion that has been advanced by some European politicians uh, of privileged partnership we think is a rather ill-defined alternative to EU membership, which would certainly be seen as a rejection by the Turks and, and would undermine support for reform and engagement uh, in the West, uh, with the West in, in Turkey. Um, as, uh, as Ed pointed out a bit, uh, the Turkish government has had limited success. One of the key things that, of course, should make Turkey a rather appealing partner is its role as an energy bridge. And as Ed pointed out, and for a variety of reasons, uh, the uh, Turks have had limited success in leveraging that card in the relationship. Uh, despite several disruptions of gas deliveries, obviously this in the last few years between uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, uh, the EU governments are, you know, certainly more interested in finding alternatives and developing the southern corridor, but there are still some doubts about uh, internal Turkish policies and, uh, and, and even differences uh, within EU governments about which, which of various alternative routes to support. So that, that has, has limited Turkey's leverage in that. 
So what we argue is that uh, it would be very damaging if the accession discussions uh, with Turkey were to, uh, were to fail uh, in the near term. The consequences, we think, would be very severe and, and widespread to Turkey's relationship, not only with Europe, but also with the United States and its other NATO allies. Uh, it could accelerate the growth of nationalist and illiberal political forces in Turkey, uh, uh, which would be counter to U.S. interests. And it might even lead to some more obstructionist policies uh, uh, by the, on the part of the Turkish government with regard to NATO-EU cooperation, some of which have, has been undertaken in recent years uh, because of, of differences over, over Cyprus's role within the European security and defense policy. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, you could also see Turkey really shifting and, and further acceleration of its, of its efforts to look for other partners, other partners uh, in the world, uh, not, only, not only in its immediate neighborhood, but even, even farther afield in East Asia and elsewhere. So what we suggest is that uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the best one can hope for in some ways and, and, uh, is to remain committed to the long-term accession process, but that, that hope that perhaps over the next 10 to 15 years as consequences that uh, Europe itself is developing in a multi-speed way, that there are very varied levels of political and economic in integration. Not everyone is obviously a member of the European Union. Not everyone is a member of the European Security and Defense Policy. Uh, there is sort of a variable a geometry that's already emerging within the European Union, and that perhaps that kind of a variable mix of engagement could provide a soft landing for a uh, somewhat truncated uh, Turkish accession process. In other words, even if it doesn't uh, adhere to all of the uh, key particularly if it's not the odd man out uh, in, that, uh, in that relationship, which indeed it isn't even uh, today as it tries to move forward on, on several chapters of the Archi Communitaire of the European Union. On Cyprus, uh, we touch on it. Ian Lesser uh, did, a, did a wonderful contribution, a feature on Cyprus, uh, drawing on long experience in this area, both on Cyprus and, and US Turkish relations as well. Uh, he points out that Cyprus really, uh, you know, for which had been a, so much of a flashpoint and a focal point of of the U.S.-Turkish relationship and, of, and of, of relations with Greece and the whole region uh, has become really less central uh, to the strategic environment. Uh, but the situation on the island is still a little bit uncertain and the prospects for a settlement remain unclear. Uh, and, and this still has significant implications for, uh, for the U.S.-Turkish relations and for a, really a blossoming uh, a, a detente and, and, and cooperation between uh, Greece and Turkey, which has been moving forward quite, quite smartly. Uh, the, the current leadership on the island, uh, we, we feel, and, and a number of other colleagues here also have studied uh, Bulent and others have studied Cyprus, feel that indeed the, the, the current relationships between uh, uh, the two leaders, between uh, Talat and Christofias, are, are probably as, as good as they've ever been since the Anan plan of 2004, which almost uh, began to solve this problem. But after months of talks, uh, it still seems that significant differences over power sharing and other issues persist. Uh, and it's not clear that this current favorable climate can, uh, can persist indefinitely. So what do we suggest uh, here again? Uh, we, uh, our, our call is for uh, cautious uh, U.S. diplomacy, um, uh, that uh, quiet but consistent U.S. engagement uh, with European governments is probably the most effective way to continue to advance Turkey's accession discussions. Uh, it's not as uh, a number of the uh, U.S. diplomats in the room know, it's never a welcome. Uh, uh, the, the various U.S. demarches about Turkish membership are, are not usually very welcome, but I do think that still a firm, and we, we as a group felt that a, a firm and steady support for Turkish membership and, and continued efforts to try to support that and to support some of the reforms in Turkey that are essential to that process are a useful and valuable step. With regard to uh, the Turkey's EU uh, membership and also uh, uh, in terms of uh, helping to sort out the NATO-EU relationship, we think that one of the most helpful steps that Washington could take uh, is to uh, try to overcome uh, and, and, uh, is some of the differences uh, on, on the island of Cyprus itself. And, and here uh, we think that uh, solving the Cyprus problem and, and at least moving forward on some kind of a, a settlement between the two communities could be very helpful to to, uh, to uh, both enhancing uh, NATO-EU relations and also, of course, in, in advancing Turkey's relationship with the EU. There is, of course, now a special UN envoy, Alexander Downer, the former Australian Prime Minister who is actively engaged in these discussions. Uh, and what we suggest is that perhaps the U.S. could also designate a senior diplomat to work closely uh, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Downer, but also uh, with the uh, uh, Greek government, with the Turkish Republic of, of Northern Cyprus, uh, and, and to put sort of steady and, and concerted uh, uh, pressure on all the parties, really, uh, on the EU to end economic isolation of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, on the Turkish government to take some reciprocal steps to open uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to normalize relations with Nicosia, 
uh, consistent with its commitments, and also on the Greek government to, uh, to try to, uh, to put some pressure on the Turkish uh, Cypriot government to, uh, to, to move forward and, and put behind uh, some of these issues that are, that are really otherwise stymieing important developments within the building of, of Europe, whole and free and at peace with one another. Let me just touch briefly on Russia. Uh, the Russia-Turkish rapprochement is really an historic development uh, that was spotlighted uh, in, in really stark, uh, stark terms in the aftermath of the Georgia War. The, uh, but what, uh, what uh, Andrew Kutchins and, and Alexander Peterson point out is that actually the growing Turkish-Russia rapprochement was really uh, building uh, even much earlier, particularly on growing trade and investment and energy ties over the past decade as well as a very strong personal relationship between, uh, between the Prime Minister Erdogan and, uh, and Prime Minister Putin. Uh, Turkey's evolving sense of its national interest and its strategy uh, that's been articulated by the Turkish Prime Minister's advisor Davidolo of zero problems along its borders uh, has also led to a certain amount of, of balancing, of, of more explicit balancing in relations between Russia and its NATO allies. But I think Turkish officials pointed out to us clearly, and I do think that as we looked at the record, it did show that Turkey is approaching Russia with a certain uh, wariness, a proper wariness, I think, and that it remains firmly tied to its Euro-Atlantic moorings, uh, but that Turkey's geostrategic position is such that it has to take into account uh, these changing relations, this changing geostrategic reality, and uh, its energy dependence on Russia and its, and its uh, efforts to try to also promote stability uh, in the Caucasus and the Black Sea and how it goes about doing that in the most effective way uh, as, as an area that there are some differences between the United States and Turkey. We also just mentioned briefly, and, I, and we can come back to this discussion about the Caucasus and the Black Sea in discussion, we do mention also Turkey's interest in Central Asia, which of course there was a great flowering of that interest and great hopes of the pan-Turkic ideas uh, surfacing and having greater uh, impact uh, in, in Central Asia. Uh, but uh, the fact is that the realities of, of transit to, to Russia, other, other kinds of historical ties and limited resources have not led to this great wellspring. But there is another opportunity, I think, on the horizon, and particularly uh, apropos President Obama's trip and his focus now on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and that is that Turkey has prided, provided, of course, significant military support to the International Security Assistance uh, Mission, uh, the NATO ISAF mission in Afghanistan along with ver valuable soft power assets and resources on a bilateral basis to support stabilization and development of Afghanistan. Turkey also has a very strong relationship with Pakistan historically. It has had uh, undertaken some initiatives to bring the governments of Afghanistan and Pakistan together to form a more constructive relationship. And so we think that Turkey should also be looked to in this context as, as a way in which uh, it could provide additional support to, to that process, uh, and particularly with regard to engagement uh, in Pakistan. We think that the Obama administration should support Turkey's proposal for uh, creating a, a Caucasus stability and cooperation platform. That we think this has some real potential to uh, helping to resolve some of the frozen conflicts in, in the Caucasus region and that Turkey can play an important role uh, as an intermediary. And of course, we, we also uh, recognize the historic uh, uh, developments that are uh, underway and the, and the potential that's there in, in Turkey's effort to normalize relations with Armenia. So let me just touch briefly in, in, uh, in two, truly a two-minute drill since my partners have already red carded me to stop, uh, and we are at the five o'clock hour, um, <clears throat> excuse me, about, about the main uh, framework for the relationship. We think that uh, an Obama administration initiative that would seek to engage the Turkish government uh, uh, in articulating a positive common agenda for strategic cooperation would be very well received, and indeed the, the, the harbinger of this and the recognition of this was indeed shown during uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, visit, which unfortunately came before we finished this report, but, uh, but, but we were thinking along the same lines, I have to say, the notion that we should build on, indeed, the, a document that was agreed to uh, in 2006 uh, uh, during Ambassador Wilson's tenure uh, in Ankara and uh, the so-called shared vision and structured dialogue, which was, a, which was a very good document in terms of articulating a sense of, of common goals and visions. And it did make some progress in advancing uh, interests in, in a couple of areas, but this is something that we think uh, and, and, of course, there's always a tendency in any new administration to do anything but what the other guys did. And so I, I think we salute, uh, I salute as someone who's worked in government, the Clinton administration, for not kicking this aside and saying, well, we'll come up with our own strategy or our own, uh, our own framework. I think this framework has real merit and one that obviously the Turkish government has embraced and one that could be further defined and elaborated. And so we, what we suggest is that you could augment this and re give it real energy and dynamism by having uh, periodic uh, high-level policy dialogue and an action agenda with some specific timelines to advance cooperation and manage 
policy differences. This could be supported by uh, working groups uh, of various kinds charged with monitoring implementation of some of these uh, areas. So we think the positive agenda, as you've already seen in some of the comments of my colleagues, should focus on, on first of all, long-term stabilization of Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan, expansion of trade and investment and military-to-military -military cooperation, and promoting Turkey's EU membership. Now, the agenda, we think, should also include some areas where cooperation will have great impact, and our interests are broadly similar, but there still are some policy differences. We have to be quite candid. Uh, but these could be uh, our cooperation in this area could be managed if we do if we if we have a steady process and uh, and uh, those areas that we think include uh, policy towards Russia towards Armenia and Greece uh, development of the southern corridor routes uh, for Caspian energy resources and and fostering uh, an Israeli Palestinian settlement and dealing with the frozen conflicts uh, in the Caucasus and also in Cyprus. Now, there are several areas that we do note that where there are some more fundamental and potential policy differences that will need to be carefully, carefully managed. Uh, and that is, first of all, deals with uh, increasing Russian assertiveness in the Black Sea and along its periphery, on energy and trade relations with Iran, on slowing Iran's nuclear program, and safeguarding democracy and the rule of law within Turkey itself. These are all delicate and sensitive issues. Um, we think that there are a number of mechanisms that could be developed to enhance Turkish-U.S. Uh, uh, economic relationship. We think the scope for a, a more robust soft power uh, relationship, uh, and indeed the uh, administration has already signaled its interest in, in uh, beginning uh, some further educational exchange, but we think other person-to-person -person exchanges, cultural exchanges, and also some kind of a more systematic engagement between the Turkish Grand National Assembly and U.S. counterparts. There are some exchanges, but we think perhaps that could be more routinized. And last but not least, we didn't duck the very difficult issue that is before the Congress even right now, the question which we think would create a great uncertainty in the future of, of the U.S.-Turkish relationship, and that is the Armenian Genocide Resolution. My personal view and the view of, of I think, most of my colleagues is that uh, if President Obama takes no action to prevent congressional enactment of this resolution, House Resolution 252, or endorses the measure or uses the word genocide, genocide himself in discussing uh, the this, this situation uh, that happened at the end of the, of the Ottoman Empire and, and the atrocities and, and terrible uh, loss of life that took place uh, in that end of war, end of war and, and, and end of empire period, the Turkish response would be harsh and would trigger a prolonged breach in the relationship. We suggest that rather than trying to legislate history, the United States Congress and the international community should provide maximum encouragement and support to the diplomatic rapprochement being pursued by the governments of Turkey and, and Armenia, as well as to the emerging uh, regional cooperation. We think in that regard, too, that a, a joint historical commission could be helpful to that process, and we encourage uh, the parties to pursue that uh, approach. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Uh, we've tried to cover a lot of terrain and a very complicated relationship. As my colleague said, we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. We have, we have some microphones. If I could just ask you to raise your hand and identify yourself when you are approached by someone. Yes, uh, yes, Stan Cover. Uh, Stanley Cover with the Cato Institute. One subject that has not been mentioned, and it may be too new, is the selection of the new Secretary General of NATO. And from what I understand, the, uh, there's been concern expressed in Turkey because of, uh, he is from Denmark and the association with the Danish cartoons. I've seen very little discussion. I don't know how seriously to take this, but I, I wonder if one or two of the panelists might be able to address that. Okay. I guess the, the default option. I, uh, I think this is still an – I stand you're quite right. I think this is still an unfolding issue. Uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen did uh, – uh, one of the, the concerns that have been out there, the, the President, uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen was somewhat reticent. To, when the cartoon episode erupted, uh, he was somewhat reticent to uh, take an offer of Turkish support to try to uh, begin perhaps in a, a dialogue uh, and among Danes and other he, – he was more robust in defending free speech and less in sort of suggesting that perhaps some dialogue uh, between uh, – uh, the Muslim communities uh, in Denmark and, and elsewhere in Europe and, and Muslim countries and, and Turks. So that was seen as a bit of a front. Obviously, uh, Turkey is, uh, as I understand it, somewhat concerned about the fact that Raj uh, TV is still housed in, in uh, Denmark, uh, the Kurdish uh, uh, TV station, which is seen as an, uh, an affiliate of the PKK. 
Uh, there are other, other concerns that have, have been out there about uh, Rasmussen's uh, outspoken uh, opposition to Turkish uh, full membership in the EU. So uh, I don't know that if this is going to become a crisis. Uh, I, I think there's active diplomatic discussions underway right now. Uh, as far as I know, and uh, if, if uh, Ambassador Sensei wants to, he could, I could let him uh, articulate the Turkish government's position right now. But as far as I know, the Turkish government officially has not uh, uh, raised its uh, 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 a complete opposition to Mr. Rasmussen. Um, the Turkish government is still considering the pros and cons of different candidates to this position. So we've made it clear that uh, this is nothing personal as far as uh, Prime Minister Rasmussen is concerned. But uh, there are certain messages that the election of a new Secretary General is going to uh, project to the whole world and especially to the Islamic world. And that is why the uh, Turkish Prime Minister and, uh, and the leadership has really voiced some of these concerns. But um, so far, um, no decision has been taken and um, discussions are going on. That's all I can say at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, there's a hand in the back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right in the, on the far side there. Hi, my name is Zahar. My name is Zahar Hasanov. I'm a reporter from Azerbaijan. It's on. It's on. I want to ask you a question about uh, uh, reopening border between Armenia and Turkey, which is expected somewhere in the middle of April. So that's the rumors which we have so far. And don't you think that this kind of action will, will, will create or will leave Azerbaijan with no chance but use its military forces to overtake Nagorno-Karabakh? And second, uh, with population of 80% Shia Muslims, Azerbaijan going to look rather than on Tehran or Moscow rather than on Ankara in its political future. So what's your thought about that? Well, go ahead, Chief George. Yeah, I'll take a crack at this. I mean, look, I know you, you asked this question before when you came to, to a meeting that we had. Um, and I know, no, and I respect, no, I respect your, your views uh, as an Azeri uh, and your concern about the, the opening of the border. Frankly, if it was easy, Turkey would have opened that border long ago. Um, uh, the Armenian lobby is convinced that the only reason that Turkey is doing this is to uh, ward off the danger of the adoption of the, of, of the resolution. Um, uh, I think Turkey does genuinely want to, uh, a better relationship with Armenia, but also recognizes that it cannot take this step bilaterally without taking Azerbaijan into account. Uh, when uh, Advisor Davutoglu was here, um, he mentioned the uh, Azerbaijan is an important factor in, uh, in, the, uh, in the equation. Um, I think you have reason to be concerned because, you know, Azerbaijan will undoubtedly be affected, but I don't think that Turkey will take any step uh, without taking into account uh, your country. Alex Oliveris with the American uh, Hellenic Institute. Do you, do you agree uh, as a gesture that Turkey should withdraw its 40, 43, estimated 43,000 uh, Turkish troops from the island of Cyprus as a strong gesture that they are very serious on unifying the island since uh, this occupation, this illegal military occupation, has been continuously condemned by UN resolutions? Well, I think that's more than a gesture, but uh, maybe, Belen, would you like to? No? I think uh... um, my name is Alisher Abidjanov. I'm from National University of Uzbekistan and visiting fellow at John Hopkins right now. And uh, as we heard that uh, Turkey is a real true ally of uh, United States in the East and especially in Middle East. And another uh, true ally of U.S. is Israel. And, but relationships between these countries is not perfect. And 
events in Davos in Switzerland that show it very well. And what do you think how these contradictions between these two countries can affect to the relationships between uh, two U.S.-Turkey relations? Thank you. I guess that falls in the Middle East category. So are you, are you asking the way I read, uh, understood your question is, is how can uh, the tension between Israel and Turkey be managed by the United States? Is that? Well, Israel has a strong uh, relationship with the U.S., obviously, and it has a strong relationship with Turkey based on mutual interest. Um, and that's been going on for several decades. There has been tension, obviously, and, and more public tension and fallout uh, diplomatically on, and uh, politically over the um, Gaza events, uh, over the Lebanon war in 2006, and we've seen more of that. But I think that the foundation of Israeli-Turkish cooperation remains strong, and both uh, the government of Turkey and the government of Israel have tried to downplay the differences and have tried to downplay the tension. If you've noticed, despite the rhetoric uh, after the Davo, throughout the Davos incidents and, and throughout the Gaza war, n no uh, cooperation agreement, uh, no diplomatic agreement or economic arrangement ha has been canceled or altered as a result of this political fallout. So I think this main it was maintained at a, at a certain diplomatic level, uh, but I think that has subsided. There still remains uh, the potential for tension between Israel and Turkey, but I think both Turkey and Israel still see uh, great interest in, in cooperation along a range of uh, mutually beneficial interests, and that relationship will endure despite the tension. Thank you. I'm Svante Cornell from the Central Asia Caucasus Institute at Johns Hopkins. I'd like to ask a question. It may possibly be uh, uh, to Dr. Aliriza. Um, I think there is a short mention in your uh, paper, which, of course, we haven't been able to read yet on, on this. But I wonder if you'd like to say something about the issues of freedom of speech in Turkey and the fact that the government has taken steps to take over or have businesses very close to itself take over uh, large media concerns in the country as well as impose a huge fine on the country's largest media uh, outlet. Would you care to comment on that? Yeah, happy to. In fact, uh, we, I go into this in, in the report, and uh, I talk about how uh, uh, the, uh, the ruling party, uh, which supported and benefited from uh, uh, Turkey being a more open society, has actually presided over society becoming less open and some of the, the aspects of, of this process you have mentioned. Um, I'd very much hope that, uh, that the local election results uh, are a warning shot across the bowels of, the, of this government that, uh, that maybe uh, all that it's been doing does not have the, the support of the, of the Turkish people. I mean, I didn't have enough time to, to go into uh, uh, touch on other than the most salient points of my, of my presentation, but I'm concerned about what the, the way things are going. Uh, uh, this is an institution that hosted Prime Minister Erdogan when he was an opposition leader, and he was pushing for an open society and an open media and criticizing some of the things that the previous government was doing for the same things uh, to be happening uh, in different ways, but, you know, uh, but the end result being the, being the same is, I think, very unfortunate. And I would very much hope that, uh, that the government would ease up uh, its, its pressure on, on the media because, frankly, without a, a free media, uh, then you cannot have an open society. And um, the JDP, the Justice and Development Party, the Ag Party, uh, was a supporter of the, of the open society. And uh, anything that's detrimental to, to that open society will be not just against uh, its own interests, but against the interests of, of, of the country. Thank you. Uh, who is it from CNN Turk and Millet? This is for Mr. Hai Malka. You mentioned that the Turkish Israeli relations are, despite all the rhetoric, are, are strong and sound. Um, can you elaborate on, a li on, a, on it a little bit? Because it seems like down in the bottom level, on, on grassroots and public view, it is probably versed in Turkey's resentment towards Euro uh, United States during a Bush era right now. And one of the parties that um, advocated a more stronger action against Israel uh, gained some ground during the, the, the local elections. Do you, don't you think it's a little harder to do anything with, um, between these two countries now? 
Well, I think Turkish public opinion um, is probably wary and critical of the strong Turkish-Israeli relationship. Um, it's increasingly difficult, more difficult for the AKP government to justify such strong relations with Israel, uh, especially in times of crisis and heightened violence in the Middle East, uh, whether it be between Israel and Lebanon or Israel and Gaza and the Palestinians. Uh, so I think that issue is going to increasingly uh, – is, is going to complicate the Israeli-Turkish relationship uh, and make it more difficult for Israel and Turkey to cooperate on a, on a public level on high-profile issues like military cooperation, of which uh, Israel and Turkey have a very strong relationship. But at the same time, I'll reiterate what I said before, that Israel and Turkey share very strong and concrete uh, overlapping interests on a range of issues, be they political, economic, or military. Uh, and I think those interests will endure, and I think that the relationship uh, will overcome the tension that arises despite the complexity uh, of their relations. Um, I'm Ali Aslan, Washington correspondent for Turkish Daily Zaman newspaper. Uh, I'm reading your report here, and there is a sentence – actually, in, there's a paragraph uh, talking about uh, the official dogma of the Turkish government, which is Kemalism, and Kemalists trying to restrict the power of elected governments to act outside its principles. And there's, and there's a sentence here which kind of confused me and a little surprised, frankly. And it says, these strictures, often called Kemalism, maintained by the Constitutional Court and the Turkish General Staff, effectively prevent the emergence of an Islamist state in Turkey. So this sentence interestingly suggests as if there is a real danger of Islamist state in Turkey and also as if you are condoning those uh, restrictions uh, applied by the Kamalists. What is your – can you clarify that for me, please? Yeah. Go ahead. I think we were trying to describe uh, there without cond taking sides in that debate, but just describing what we think is the balance of, of power politically within, within Turkey today. that that you have uh, those who feel that uh, that there is uh, – that there are those certainly in – among the traditional Kemalist elite who feel that there is a, a hidden agenda out there among uh, AK or at least some of AK supporters and that uh, the strictures and the, and the sort of the various threats that we've seen over the last several years in governmental crises have been to try to define those boundaries as, as AK has tried to redefine what secularism means and what the Kemalist vision should mean and, and uh, both the Constitutional Court and the, the, the general staff, seeing themselves as guardians of, of that legacy, have, have taken various steps to try to, to set bounds and limits. But uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, we don't think that uh, – we came out in general in, in our assessment and that we didn't think that AUK's agenda was hidden at all. We think that AUK has been very clear over the last seven years, of, uh, plus of government, that it wants to allow for a, a redefinition of the secular model that was implemented. but. Uh, but that it's not trying to move uh, towards uh, some kind of establishment of Sharia or any other sort of uh, move in that direction. We think it simply wants to reflect the support that is definitely out there among the broader base of the population to allow more open expressions of piety in public life. Uh, and that, that really is where we came out, I think, on that. Babu Lamp may want to. Yeah, I'll pick that up. Look, I tried to touch on this in, in my section, too. Uh, um, and you and I have talked about this in, 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 the, in the past. Uh, clearly, there are some tensions in Turkish society uh, that can only be explained in terms of what I mentioned in, in, uh, uh, in my introduction, which is that the constitutional uh, framework uh, is still vigorously, strictly secular. And within it, uh, uh, the, the people tend to be more religious, more devout, and pushing the limits of what was previously acceptable to those who maintain the secular system, not least the TGS. And now, uh, we had a case in the Constitutional Court in which this party, uh, the ruling party, was defined as being the center of anti-secular activities, and it, on, it only escaped being shut down by one vote. 
uh, before that, we had that confrontation with the TGS over the election to the presidency. These are not normal uh, um, events that, that happen in a society that has achieved a compromise, uh, that is acceptable, a consensus is the word I was looking for, a consensus that is acceptable to all parties uh, that function within it. Uh, now, from the very outset, uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan has said that this party is non-Islamist. Uh, nonetheless, it was objectively defined as being Islamist. And I use the word because you, you focused on that word in the, in, in the text. Uh, and determined to reverse the secular system. Now, the secular system has survived. Mr. Erdogan and, and Ak have confirmed, whenever they were questioned, that they want to stay within this function, within the secular system. Nonetheless, as we know, from the very day that they took office in 2002, there have been people who were opposed to it in one form or another uh, who said that ultimately what they wanted to do was to bring, reverse the secular system and set up an Islamic state. Now, I don't think we're going to have an Islamic state in Turkey. I don't think too many people want an Islamic state, even if it could be done uh, in Turkey. Uh, and I also think that the secular system needs to be revised, uh, uh, restructured to allow growing religiosity by its people. Are we anywhere near that consensus? I fear not, which is why I, f uh, I suspect that the kind of tensions that we've lived through before, uh, we may live again. Adil Bagheera from the U.S. Turkic Network. Uh, I have a question, I guess, for Ed Chow. Um, I haven't read the entire report yet, obviously, but uh, what are your uh, predictions about the Nabucco pipeline? Because you've mentioned, obviously, the Nabucco a few times in the report. You've also mentioned the BTC and uh, shown how it's been a success, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't seem to be matched by either U.S. government or Western European governments in the case of Nabucco. And second question related to it is the uh, current plans between Turkey and Russia to, uh, to expand the Blue Stream pipeline and to basically, uh, uh, you know, double or even uh, increase even uh, by more than that the gas exports uh, from Russia uh, to Turkey and therefore uh, basically uh, rendering useless any other pipeline, any other gas pipeline uh, to the region. Thank you. Okay, let me, let me just see if there's, there's one, I think we have time for one last question. Let Danny, behind you there, Ann Witkowski has a question and then. Uh... You want me to ask it now? Okay. Uh, Ann Witkowski, CSIS Senior Associate. Um, you talked about uh, Russian Turkish rapprochement at the same time, a certain wariness of Turkey toward Russia. Um, given these tensions, uh, this is a question for Steve Flanagan. I wonder if you would care to venture a view on the prospects for Turkish flexibility with respect to possible solutions um, with respect to Russian suspension of the CFE treaty implementation, uh, given especially that two of the key problems are Russia's uh, continuing presence in Georgia, contrary to its 1999 uh, commitments at the Istanbul summit and its desire to eliminate the flank limit uh, of the treaty, which would, of course, um, affect its flex Russia's flexibility uh, in its south. Thanks. Thank you. Ed, you want to speak? I, I uh, spent a lot of effort in Caspian oil and gas meetings not to utter the words Nabucco uh, because I'm afraid of what I might say. Um, it's a very challenging uh, project. It's a long, long distance uh, from upstream, which would be in the Caspian, uh, uh, f across half a dozen transit, essentially transit countries, rather than ultimate consuming countries before you get to Austria. Um, and um, it, it is the, the sort of project that, uh, in, in commercial terms, would, one wouldn't want to try to build first. Uh, building the more expensive project is, is not one you would do if you had uh, uh, the option uh, not to. So I, I'm, I'm much more interested in smaller um, uh, uh, projects that, as I said, build on existing infrastructure uh, as well as nearby markets. So I tend to think of filling up the South Caucasus uh, gas pipeline as being the first priority uh, for Turkey and, I, and Azerbaijan. 
uh, as well as looking at smaller options such as the uh, Turkish Greek uh, connector and then uh, going on to Italy as being the kind of projects that you can stage more easily with smaller capital investment. Now, governments can subsidize whatever projects they want. I mean, governments have the capability of doing that. And, and whether European governments will ultimately do that or not uh, remains to be seen. But that's what we require uh, if, if Nabucco is going to be done anytime soon. The, the major problem is that there isn't sufficient gas coming out of the Caspian yet. And, and so in order to get 30 billion cubic meters worth of gas per year out of the Caspian requires a, 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 a speedier, uh, full development of the gas sector in Azerbaijan, particularly the next stage of Shak Deniz II, the, 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 uh, the next stage of Shak Deniz, the uh, lower gas uh, zones uh, of the um, um, Azeri, Shirak, uh, Ganeshli fields, as well as what I said before, uh, Turkmenistan. And, and that's where we need to be working together to create the upstream opportunities for those flows to, the, to, to go west. And, and I think that that's what's important. The, the problem with Turkey talking about doubling Blue Stream 2 or Turkey receiving Russian uh, uh, um, uh, offers to double Blue Stream uh, is that it's the same molecules we're talking about for Nabucco. Uh, it's basically essentially Central Asian gas transiting uh, 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 Russia to go to Turkey as opposed to uh, going through Azerbaijan and, and, and uh, Georgia to, to Turkey. So um, as, as you rightly said, uh, Blue Stream uh, 2 uh, or South Stream for that matter, which is another competing project, uh, are competing for the same Central Asian gas molecules to go to European markets as Nabucco. Steve, can I just add something? You know, the, um, it's a lot more complicated than it was during the days of the BTC because the whole idea of the BTC was an east-west corridor that Turkey and the U U.S. cooperated on, which avoided Russia. Now, recently what you had was the Turkish energy minister who accompanied the Turkish president to Moscow, and then before then the Turkish foreign minister saying that uh, Nabucco uh, could carry Russian gas, quote-unquote. Now, that would defeat the object of the exercise because the whole point of Nabucco was that it would provide an alternative to Russian gas going from, let's say, Turkmenistan through Turkey uh, all the way to Western Europe. And what really needs to be done uh, is for the U.S., Russia, and Turkey uh, to talk about how it is that they can cooperate on, uh, on these issues, because now with the U.S. talking about resetting the, the uh, pressing the reset button with, uh, with Russia, uh, uh, then maybe the U.S. would be more willing to accommodate the Turkish-Russian relationship, the north-south axis that is developed even when the east-west corridor was being developed. So you cannot think in terms of, of, of Nabucco being a parallel project that the U.S. and Turkey will, come, uh, will cooperate in in exactly the same way, just as Ed said, without taking into account Russia, and maybe this administration will do better with that than uh, the previous one. And just quickly, because uh, unfortunately we do have to end uh, promptly <clears throat> because of another event coming behind us. Uh, with regard to Ann Rutkowski's question on CFE, I have not discussed specifically with Turkish officials about their, their approach to the, to the CFE renegotiation issue uh, in, in any detail, but my sense is that it will depend a lot on the context. Uh, obviously, if there is some forward movement on some uh, normalization relations with Armenia, other aspects of, of a, a burgeoning uh, a new set of relationships that this Caucasus Stability and Cooperation Platform moves forward, there might be some prospect. I mean, certainly, I mean, I think, as you know, much better than I, I mean, for both the Turks and the Norwegians are going to be very concerned about the flank limitations and, and sort of unfettered allowance of this. And, of course, even, you know, the, the first stumbling block, it seems to me, that has to be answered is the question of what to do about the Istanbul commitments that the, that the Russians had to, to, dis, to uh, remove themselves from the base in what is now this independent Republic of Abkhazia. So, so that's another stumbling block. What, what will be some of the provisions? But I suspect there's, there's not as, uh, you know, it, it'll really depend a lot on the context, but I think there's not as much anxiety perhaps as there once was, although it's still out there, about how the Russians might, uh, you know, engage in and in use the re removal of the treaty limits to engage in a further buildup and, and the potential for further intervention along its periphery. So I think it's, it'll be heavily dependent on how does the rest of the relationship um, is evolving because, you know, further actions against Georgia obviously would really imperil Turkey's uh, interest in stability in the region and, and obviously in energy transit from the region. So 
Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's you know some of the markers. But um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, my, my both my voice is failing now, and the uh, and the time has run up. But I want to thank all of you for your uh, joining us. I want to thank again to our senior advisors and our two ambassadors for, for their interest and support in this work. And lastly, to a, like any, any project of this nature, a platoon of, uh, of very able research, researchers and, and interns uh, led by uh, Kaylee Levitt, but also including uh, uh, Denny, Denny Camisi, uh, Jessica Sims, Dan Brady, and, uh, uh, and uh, Liz, uh, Liz Morehouse, and, uh, and several others who can't be mentioned in, in the time allowed. But uh, 